Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all once again. As most of you may already be aware, this conference is compassionately brought to you by the generosity of Bigrim, our principal sponsor. As a special agenda to our program this afternoon, it is my pleasure to inform you that we will have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Harold Link, the company's chairman and chief executive officer. In this connection, please allow me to invite Mr. James Stent, our senior seizure advisor, council member of the SAM Society, and a longtime resident of Bangkok, to introduce Dr. Harold Link, along with some interesting facts on Bikram to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wynn. Good afternoon. I hope you've all had a delicious, if short, lunch. The theme that has appeared and reappeared in the keynote speeches and the first five panels of our conference over the past uh, 36 hours is that effective climate action requires that human beings relate ethically and spiritually with the ecosystem. In the past, the traditional cultures of Southeast Asia knew that man's survival depended on living in harmony with nature. Sadly, in the modern era, Southeast Asians, along with the rest of the world, have lost that deep understanding and no longer realize that the future of our species is interdependent with the future of all species of flora and fauna in the world. Among the wealth of species in Southeast Asia, two in particular capture people's imagination, elephants and tigers. Our next speaker, Dr. Harold Link, will speak to us about the work of his company, Be Grim, to save the wild tiger in Thailand. The tiger, as we all know, is the apex predator. It is the top of the food chain in Thailand and elsewhere in ASEAN countries. For the people of Southeast Asia, recovering tiger populations in the wild can be a powerful symbol of reestablishing a harmonious and benign relationship with the region's ecosystem, as has been called for by all of the speakers whom we have heard in the first panels of this conference. Healthy tiger populations can demonstrate a restoration of Southeast Asia's traditional cultural respect for the living creatures of the forest. If tigers once again achieve sustainable populations, that would indicate that the ecosystem is once again in sustainable condition. Founded in 1878 by two Germans, Bigrim is the oldest company in Thailand. In the early 20th century, Adolf Link took over control of the firm. And for the past 30 years, Adolf's grandson, Dr. Harold Link, has led development of what has now grown into a major group of companies with a broad range of operations, especially including sustainable energy projects. Its floating solar installation in Vietnam is the largest solar farm in Southeast Asia. In addition to Thailand and Vietnam, Bigrim is undertaking solar, wind, and hydro energy projects in Laos, Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, Korea, and Poland and it has committed to zero carbon footprint by 2050. Aside from being a highly profitable commercial enterprise, Bigrim practices its motto of, quote, doing business with compassion. It supports a wide variety of projects in the fields of natural environment, education, and culture for the people of Thailand. The Link family has long been a supporter of the Siam Society. In the plaque at the back of the wall, hanging beneath the portrait there, is a plaque uh, dating from 1878, uh, 1978, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Siam Society, and listing beneath it the 10 major donors to the Siam Society on that auspicious occasion. The, number of the first, name, uh, first names on the list are those of Mr. Herbert Link and Kunying Alma Link, the uncle and aunt of our speaker today. Subsequent to that, Dr. Harold Link served as treasurer of the Siam Society. I am delighted to announce that this morning, Dr. Link, on behalf of Bigrim Power and Kun Pilaipan, president of the Siam Society, signed an agreement under which Bigrim will become a top-level corporate financial sponsor 
of the work of the society and Sicha. The agreement arises out of the values which B. Grimm and the Siam Society share. That is a commitment to conserving, promoting, and celebrating the rich natural and cultural heritage of Thailand and its neighboring countries, and a commitment to serving its people. The Siam Society is proud to partner with B. Grimm. We look forward to a long and fruitful relationship that will enable us, in the words of Dr. Link, to empower compassionately. In addition to leading the B. Grimm Group, Dr. Link is president of the Royal Bangkok Symphony Orchestra and president of the Southeast Asian Equestrian Foundation, among many positions he holds. I now invite Dr. Link to address our conference. Thank you very much, James. <coughs> we didn't know each other before, even though we arrived in Thailand about the same time. <laughs> and says uh, Thailand is a village, but actually maybe not such a small village. <coughs> so thank you very much. My family owes everything to Thailand. So my whole life was uh, due to the generosity of Thai people to have be, grim, be an active part of Thai society. <coughs> So we feel very much like Thai. Um, our children born in Thailand, one of our grandchildren born in Thailand, and we hope that the company will continue under the auspices of, of the other members of my family going forward. Now, nowadays, if you are not digitally active or your life is not really digital, you are not, you're not up to date. And of course, we now see that the new range of computers are even a million times faster than the current ones. And young people are very digitally active. Yesterday I was sitting with somebody who said that when parents now, mothers now are breastfeeding, often they don't look at their child anymore, they just flip through their Instagram. So, if we're not digitally active as a company, we cannot thrive in the new world. And so, we Grimm probably the first company that will have a digital twin of a power plant. Even though we have been searching the whole world. And we found finally a Thai company that can do it. <coughs> Part of CM Cement Group. We brought a digital university, not a digital university, a university that teaches young people to become a good entrepreneur and in that a digital entrepreneur. So bring kind of the capabilities of Stanford to Thailand, but not as a university as you know it, with um, professors teaching, but with business people teaching, those who have successful startups. And you can all read about the metaverse. So, kind of seems like people aspire to have their avatar do, do stuff in the metaverse. Myself, growing older, the last thing I want to do is have an avatar in the metaverse or live in the metaverse or live on the Mars. I think well, this is the most beautiful world and it's worth pre preserving. So, when we are very active in industrial park development, the utilities there. And so now friends of ours want us to join their smart city. So I've been traveling the world to find out what is a smart city. <clears throat> because most people talk about smart city in terms of digital enablement. Finally, I found a person who I think speaks out of our hearts. He said, a smart city is one where you want to live. So we should use the digital technologies to support life of nature and our life with nature. <clears throat> so we like to support forestry and we like to support the tigers. Why support tigers? 
somehow as Bikram, we like to support uh, things that, activities which we think are important for the country, but don't have many people who think likewise or think enough that they would like to part with their hard-earned money for that purpose. So, tiger conservation, unfortunately, hasn't found any other company besides Bikram to support it in Thailand. <coughs> and so, we try to do as much as we can and now recently try to get other companies to, to join in this endeavor. So, um, people ask, even in the company, why tiger? Scary. Tiger eat people. Why do you want to save them? And so, I think the easiest way to understand for everybody also in this room is have a look when you take the top of the food chain out and then when you reintroduce them what happens to the landscape? What happens to the animals? And then you can understand why we have to protect the top of the food chain in our jungles. Whether it's in Thailand, whether it's in Malaysia, there are still tigers left, or Indonesia, where I just learned there are still 600 left, more than in Thailand. So, can you maybe play the video? It's about how the wolves being reintroduced in the Yellowstone Park changed rivers. scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, but the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers uh, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less 
erosion, the channels narrowed, more pools formed, more riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. So I think the camera's very clear. Fully agree. So uh, we are a family of horse lovers. So one day I I read about people who can talk to animals, and so told a friend about him. <coughs> he was an engineer. He thought it was ridiculous. But the next year, when we met again, he gave me two books about how to talk to animals. So I read that the same night, and then I went to a course. In that room, there were 15 people, 14 women, one man, which was me. <laughs> and so we took lessons on how to speak with animals, which everybody can do. <coughs> But when we are kids and we try to do it or think we can do it, then parents tell us that this is ridiculous. So anyway, we now we have people in, the, in, the, in our horse farm that can talk to animals and really helps me a lot when riding because you know how they feel and what's the problem. And the funny thing is that our veterinarians, they don't really try hard to talk to them. And when we had a teacher with us, the veterinarian was the last one who got it. And the first one who got it were the not so highly educated people who look after our horses and who still, not still, believe in spirits that I have seen them. So they don't have the barrier. <clears throat> so actually our lack of being able to communicate with animals is ourselves, is our, is our own closing our, the door to our heart. And so, we actually have this very close connection to animals. And so, I, I hope that our support for the tigers is helpful in keeping the top of the food chain. And um, I just went to Malaysia and talked to the head of wildlife preservation, so they have the same type of program as we have here. And so, we hope that <coughs> we'll continue. Now, this is something, a seminar about climate and climate action. We cannot, I think, we cannot have a good climate if we don't have good forests. So we first have to look after our national parks and we have to reforest it. Um, I went to a very interesting project in, on Borneo, Saba. A German friend, he, he got a big area of reforestation. So, and what they do is they have the national park inside. <coughs> so, when you have the national park inside and you do the proper forestation outside, number one, you get more animals into that part, but you can also protect the national park. In our case, we have to really talk to politicians who actually want to create benefit out of destroying the national park and have to talk the, to the schools and to the villages and all people around so that they try not to let the poachers come in. And when we started this work, the, the rangers had guns, but the guns didn't work, none of them worked. While the, when the poachers come, they have 18 different types of ammunition and very modern weapons. So we had to do many things to help them because, of course, governments always have restricted budgets. And uh, 
we will we will continue to do that and we will continue in our forestation effort because that's um, one way where people who produce electricity with gas can reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now we read all the time about companies that by 2025 they will be carbon neutral. Or I went to a building in Singapore and they said this is the first carbon neutral building. So we are in the business of outfitting buildings. So I thought this is not possible and the way the building looks is probably not. And it turns out they all buy carbon credits. So buying carbon credits is kind of like, like you remember in, in the 16th century or end of 15th century, we have the Catholic Church, you can buy your way to heaven. So and then you have the Reformation coming with Martin Luther not quite agreeing with that method. So I think we have still a long way to go to from the electricity side to become carbon neutral. Actually it doesn't look like it's very fast. Because we, we read a lot about renewable energy and Bigrim is uh, probably the largest renewable energy company in Thailand. And we are in many, many uh, different country, uh, countries with large projects. But I just read that in 2011, 9% of all electricity was made by renewable power. And 11 years or 10 years later, how much you think went up from 9%? Would think went up to 30% at least. But it went up to 13%. So this is where we are. <coughs> so all this carbon neutrality and, and buying of carbon credits is all fine but doesn't mean that the world becomes less carbon intensive. <coughs> um, carbon is also not the villain. <coughs> the villain are the, <coughs> the gases, but it's not only carbon dioxide, it's also methane and it's also NOx. <coughs> so let's not make carbon a villain because we need carbon in our lives. Let's try to reduce the carbon dioxide we, we exhaust. <coughs> and we have to try to look after our natural habitat, so to be in harmony with nature. So we, we, we try a little bit, but we know it's a small drop in the ocean, but everybody can contribute a bit. <coughs> and I'm very glad that Simon Society is also on this journey. Our family has been with Simon Society for many decades. So I wish Simon Society all the best for the future. Thank you very much for listening. bring harmony back to the forest. Please join us. Save the tigers. Thank you. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Harold Link, for sharing your words with us this afternoon. We are humbled and grateful for your support to the conference and to the SAM Society. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now continue with our next panel titled Urbanization and Built Environment. This panel will be moderated by Ms. Momo Luin and Ms. Supicha Sutanon Gun. Ms. Momo, our Seashell Vice Chairperson from Myanmar, also served as the Director of the Yangon Heritage Trust since its inception in 2012. She also specializes in the area of architecture with over 22 years of experience in the industry. 
In addition to co-founding a private architecture firm, she has also served as an executive member of the Association of Myanmar Arch Architects since 2001. Ms. Supicha is an architect and heritage practitioner with experience in projects related to history, heritage, architectural, conservation, and urban development. Her areas of interest include industrial heritage, sustainable development and climate actions, along with adaptive reuse of architecture in an urban context. I'd like to invite the speakers and the moderators for this panel to kindly make their way to the front at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming them with a round of applause. Hello, um, good afternoon, everyone. This afternoon panel, number five, brings together conservationists, architects, urban planners to investigate what the traditional design of Southeast Asian buildings in the cities offer the basic for the climate action. That the globalization, urbanization, and modernization brings uh, development, uh, uh, depletion, depletion of the resources and the uh, cities are becoming very vulnerable places with the increasing climate abnormalities. But the traditional philosophy, concept, selection of building materials and uh, uh, construction techniques create a built environment um, uh, the natural environment, uh, balancing with the natural environment and its uh, quality to responsive climate action. This panel will discuss the way that uh, cities are responsible to make uh, adaptable to the climate change. Uh, my co-moderator, Supicha, will introduce the, the panels. Thank you. So, um, welcome to the our, our panel today again. So our first speaker today is um, Ms. Lim Gek Xiang. Is she is the current president? She 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 she, she, she. <laughs> <laughs> she is a, she is the current president of Penang Heritage Trust and a member of City Council Technical Review Panel. She convened the Chinese colloquium for Penang story and participated in the writing of nomination this year, resulting in the inscription of Georgetown as a unit goal heritage site in 2008. That's impressive. So we will have our first panel start now. I pass, I'll pass the mic to you. Good afternoon. So uh, thank you very much for Sicha and for uh, th thanks to Sama for uh, nominating me to, to, to be the speaker here. So my topic today is why heritage conservation is considered as development. Because many people think that heritage is against development, but is it true? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to address this question. And um, okay, uh, any, any of you been to Penang before? Uh, Okay, so I don't need to explain too much, okay? So, Pulang Penang. Penang is located in Malaysia and Malaysia, Penang is not Malaysia, okay? So this is Penang. And Penang consists of an island and a mainland, okay? And total area is 1,448 uh, kilometers square for the whole Penang state. I purposely made these three slides when we were doing UNESCO listing because I have to go around and tell people why we do UNESCO listing and a lot of people say, Ayo, after UNESCO listing, uh, yo, we cannot develop. So I want to explain how many, how big is the area, okay? So total area of Penang State, 
Penang Island is 295 kilometers square and Georgetown World Heritage Site is this red tip of the town. Okay, so it's only 2.62, about 1% of the island. So I used to tell people, you can keep the heritage site intact and you develop our site, but not all, okay? So in Georgetown World Heritage Site, total area is 2.62 kilometers square. It consists of 92 streets, seven clan jetties, total buildings of 5,285, and out of each 3,890 uh, 3, are heritage buildings. Impressive, ne? Okay. So, what about total heritage buildings in on the island? You guess how many? One, two, three, four, five? Outside, I mean, outside World Heritage Site. Ten? Hundred? Huh? Hundred thousand? Heritage buildings, okay? And recently, our government came up with a local, proposed local plan for the whole Penang Island and the consultants identified 52 heritage buildings on the whole island. But let's see, how many? According to 1994 census, there were 12,500 heritage buildings on the island. And we do a simple minus, you know, by calculator, minus 3890 equals to 8,653. So I think Salma, we should give them a calculator. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so out, even outside of Georgetown World Heritage Site, we have 8,000 over heritage buildings. Okay, okay. so what are the approaches in heritage conservations? According to the Bura Charter, which is by the ECOMOS in, uh, since 1979, it's the Article 2, it says that there's a need to adopt a cautious approach in heritage conservation and changing as much as necessary, but as little as possible. Okay, so if you, can, you don't need to change, don't change. If you don't need to demolish, don't demolish. I, I'm very impressed with the Albert's talk this morning, you know. Just get what you need, but not what you want. Just build what you need, but not you want, okay? And the basic principles in heritage conservation is maintaining the original architecture form, maintaining the original architecture structure, maintaining the origin material, and maintaining the original techniques, okay? So, at one side, we are talking about carbon neutral buildings, but we are pulling down carbon neutral buildings to build a carbon neutral buildings. I don't understand. Okay, anyway, after Georgetown being listed as UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2008, uh, then uh, we came out with a special area plan as part of the comprehensive management plan for the World Heritage Site. And under this uh, special area plans, you know, it says that buildings are to be conserved and to be retained, restored and preserved in accor accordance to the regulation. This become my Bible because I'm sitting in the TRP for approval of the, any projects that come in for renovation, for restoration, for rebuild. So always carry that book and say, according to this SAP, you cannot do this. According to SAP, you cannot do that, okay? So, there are basic principles inside. Original structural elements should be repaired and selective replacement only considered is absolutely necessary. Total reconstruction is totally and strictly prohibited. If you pull down a heritage building in the heritage site without permission, sorry, you have to rebuild back. Okay? So, and no building or structure shall be altered or demolished if any necessary. Of course, adaptive reuse is being encouraged and recommended. So, can heritage conservation be considered as a green development? There's always a balance between heritage and development, you know, which is, okay, so people always think heritage de development must be must balance or heritage people is against development. But let's redefine, let's define what is development. You know this city, right? Is, is this called development? Is it called devel developed country? Okay, yeah, it looks very nice. A lot of high rises. In the Asian people's thinking, developments mean what? Building high rises, pulling down heritage buildings and build high rises. But look at the people look, staying inside. Do you want this type of development? Okay, and 
Do you want to have development in the price of air pollution, water pollution, okay, lead pollution, you know? Okay. And let's see what is so there are questions that have been asked this in these two days. What is development for? Okay. According to UNDP, development is to provide a decent standard of living. Doesn't mean that you have to stay in a high rise, doesn't mean you have to put down old buildings. Provide good knowledge, long, long and healthy life, and environmental sustainable. Okay, so according to Pearson, which is in my paper, uh, which I just realized that is not going to be this you know this minute out this time, development is an improvement of life, either in qualitative or quantitative or both, in use of available resources. Remember, available resources. Okay. So, examples for the developed countries. Is this country developed? Developed, right? Do you see a lot of high rises? Skyscraper? No. Where is this? Zurich. Okay. Switzerland, one of the most developed countries in the world. Uh, this, Germany. Okay. Also, they maintain the heritage buildings. They have maximum six stories. And can we say they are underdeveloped country? No, they are developed countries, right? Okay, let's see. How heritage conservation contribute to development in Penang, in Malaysia? So we have all these green, we call it green heritage houses, okay? So in Penang, Penang being on, as, not on the island, I'm talking about the island, which is in tropical, hot and humid, and it has very high underground water table. And we have many shop houses, just now, the 3,000 overs in the World Heritage Site are mainly shop houses and predates to before the introduction of electricity in 1905. Which means that when the builders, sometimes those build them are not architects, you know, they are engineers from the council or even laymen. When the builders who build these houses, they knew that this house, you know, we have high water table. And at that time, no aircon, no electricity, but they have to build houses with good ventilations and good lightings. Okay, so we optimize natural lightings and ventilations. The structures are resilient to fluctuation, the fluctuations in the water table. So Josh now has very high water table. How did our ancestors know? And how come our architects nowadays they don't know? Okay, and. That we are used to introduce a technical term called hydrostatic pressure. Okay? And why is this hydrostatic pressure very important? You know, why, why do we need to maintain the hydrostatic pressure underground? Otherwise, the house will be cracked. So I always tell people, this heritage building, actually they are supported by the hydrostatic pressure uh, underground. If you disturb the pressure, the houses will be cracked. Okay? So don't disturb them. Don't build underground car parks. Don't build underground structures. Okay. So, shop house is an, an identity for Georgetown. In terms of spatial concept, it is narrow and long. Why? Do you know why? Because in those days, the government charged the tax according to the width of the house. Okay. And we have five foot way. Okay. Five foot way was introduced by Stanford Raffles in Singapore in 1822. To, pre, you know, to provide uh, space for people to walk. So you compare to other countries where you don't have five foot way, you have to you know, provide shelters you know, and then pedestrian. We already have five foot way. And sometimes our government talking about providing pedestrian some more. Why don't they just clear the five foot way? Finish the story. Okay? And in Chinese, we call gokaki. Okay? So when you walk on this gokaki, or somebody thinks it's Mr. Gok's house, huh? there's no snatch teeth. And it provides shelters, and there's a public right in access. It is inside our Town and Country Planning Act. Okay, so the own house owner must clear the five foot way for people to walk. Otherwise, the government should take action. But our government never take action anyway. <laughs> okay, and oh, because of COVID, many of us are working from home, right? Work from home. But our ancestors already so smart; they already work from home. These houses are built as a shop house. It means they have shop downstairs, they have house upstairs. You don't have to travel, you don't have to take BTS, you don't have to drive your car and have carbon emission, go to work, right? No traffic jam. You don't have plan for one and a half hours to go to work, okay? 
zero carbon emission. Okay, so it's very and I I was born in shop house, one of shop houses. My grandfather operated his business there, and then I have time to spend with my grandfather. Just now I told somebody I know how to play scheme at the age of five. You know, I learned calligraphy all from my grandfather. Okay, yeah, because you can spend time there, and. Those days, the houses were built without aircon, and then they have good lightings, okay, and no floods. No, we have air wells. Cool. This is Salma's house, huh? Okay. So in the air well, so you can plant trees, okay. So we have free air purifier, you know, because the trees provides oxygen, correct? Salma, did you do this because by purpose, right? <laughs> okay. So design. So all these houses have design, and for us, we know we know about architecture. We look at the facade. We know when it was built, but the current design is no freestyle. We don't know what style it is. Okay. Okay. So this is an example of shop house. There, where we have like uh, wooden carved doors downstairs, very beautiful, which provides uh, security and also it has it provide ventilations. Windows provide security, but can provide ventilations because it allows air to come in. Fan light also for lightings, and upstairs we have fan light and shutter the windows. Okay. And then, so the materials used for shop house are sustainable materials. Okay, for example, the flooring is terracotta flooring, which is porous, and the terracotta flooring it was has been burned. Uh, it was been burned at a high temperature. Okay, so uh, the flooring of many shop houses been named are red hue ter terracotta, and this style make for mixture of uh, iron rich clay. You know. With the water and press and dry in the sun before they bake in a clean at the temperature of one thousand three hundred degrees C, so because of this, it is porous, and our uh, ancestors know that we have high underground water. That's why the material they choose is porous, so that the underground water can come out and breathe. When the air blows, there's a cooling effect. So it's I said that's why as I say it's a carbon neutral building. Okay. And this material is resistant to mold and bacteria. It's fire resistant. It's a good insulator and inert and sustainable. Okay. And if you look at the old maps in 1891, uh, our Kelly's map in for Georgetown, you can see that those marked red colors are actually uh, buildings with clay brick structures. So they already used since those days. So this brick structure, the bricks also, you know. The clay bricks are breathable and it can withstand uh, severe weathering actions and inert to all chemical reactions, you know. So it's highly durable. So the, the floor, we use clay tiles. The bricks, when we lay the, build, the walls, is made of clay, which is breathable and it has high thermal insulation. Nowadays, people have to use a lot of material to insulate their building, you know. Well, but all these heritage buildings already naturally, you know, can be insulate, uh, can insulate the, term, the, the heat and sound also, okay? And it's fireproof, okay? And it is environmentally friendly and reusable. Uh, how many minutes I have? Okay, sorry. No, there's no timer. Sorry, I, I, I tried to set my timer, but I can't see. Okay, six more minutes. So, and then after we lay the tiles, uh, the, the bricks, then we apply lime plaster. We don't use cement because the lime plaster is breathable. It can withstand uh, the, same, the same as the bricks and inert to chemical reaction. And it doesn't release carbon dioxide. Actually, it absorbs carbon dioxide. Okay. So, again, with the correct bricks, with the correct uh, plastering, then the moisture from the ground can come out and then it can breathe through. We call it breathable. When wind blows, okay, you will, there's a cooling effect. Then after that, we apply a layer of lime wash. If you want to have color, you just add this natural pigment. We don't use chemical. I hope there's no ICI or Nippon Paint salesman here. Otherwise, they'll kill me, okay? Yeah, because ICI or Nippon chemical paint will, is like a layer of plastic that's covering your skin, you know? There's no, you cannot breathe. Then you will damage the wall, okay? Then we use V tiles, which is made of terracotta tiles, which has the same features as the, the floor. And then it also is made of V shape. It allows rain to flow downward smoothly. And it's provide, there's a small void between the tiles so that there's a good insulation from the sun. So our ancestors, they are so smart. They know we are hot, you know, humid. But they, then they build the buildings accordingly. Uh, this is Salma's house. I drew this door before. 
to, for them to make, okay? So the wooden door, and then the doors are made of timbers, and you can see here, you know, there's a vent that you can pull to open up, okay? And then it can be, it, it can absorb vibration and heat so they won't crack, you know, can be easily pinched over. You don't like the color, you can pinch, okay? And they provide ventilations. And this is the air, this is the air vent, right? And then usually inside the house, we have partitions also reach a lot of vent holes for, for ventilations. At the same time, they carve, they carve a lot of auspicious elements to provide the vent holes, you see? So we use timber floor, okay? Yeah, and then we have uh, air well, granite air well, so which provides ventilation and light things in the house. I have checked through all plans and I calculated averagely every 10 meters or 30, 30 feet, there's an air well so that we have enough lighting to come in and, you know, enough ventilations. And one thing good is with the air well, you see, of course, according to Chinese, air well is a place where you collect your wealth, okay? So I always, I always go around and be a salesman, to, you know, heritage salesman tell people, you don't cover your air well, because uh, air well is a place you collect your money, you know. Once you cover up, uh, money won't come in, no? Uh, then they will open up their air well, okay? <laughs> So the air well is a place that they collect rainwater, and then rainwater is when it flows through the underground rain drains, and then there's a cooling effect, natural cooling, water cool system. Huh? It's not ecosystem. My my job is engineering, huh? compressed air. Okay? okay, okay. If you compare it to under unsympathetic developments, that doesn't fit. It's not fit for heritage cities. Okay, the current development, you pull down heritage buildings, you build new buildings. What you have to do? You do piling. You do waterproofing. When you do piling next to a heritage building, you are disturbing the hydrostatic pressure underground. You're going to disturb, disturb the heritage building. There was one time we built a car park at Prangi Mall, a big shopping mall, and it affected a few hundred heritage houses in the radius of one to two kilometers in the town. Okay? Yeah. Engineers always say there are, are solutions to it. Sorry, I'm an engineer, but I don't believe them. Okay? Heritage building next door cracks, okay? And then, cement is used. Cement is not environmental friendly. It releases a lot of carbon dioxide in the process of making and throughout the whole life. Lime, wells, lime will absorb carbon dioxide, okay? Cement is not breathable, not permeable. It's heavier than lime plata. It has lower tensile, style, mean, uh, tensile, tensile strength, means that it can crack easily. And he has a lower seismic load, that means that when it's a crack, you know, it will crack, you see? So, and it contains soluble salt, okay? And it will shrink over time, okay? So, if you compare a house here, house A uses lime plaster, and house B using cement, cement cannot breathe, okay? Whereas lime plaster, the, 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 it can breathe, and the moisture from underground can come out. Then you compare the wall. This is wall A being damaged by wall B because wall B here blocks all the, uh, all the, all the pores, you know. Then the moisture will just push here and the salt will push here. That's why it damaged it. And this is the wall that damage, damaged by cement, okay. I just learned from Johannes last night. Song Kla, oh, they're so smart. They have a gap between two walls, you know. They don't have the shared party wall. Then there's a gap that, so that your, your wall do not disturb my wall, okay? Yeah. <laughs> then there are other new materials like steel. You know, steel is very heavy that you, ne you need a bigger piling, you know, and then, uh, I mean, piling glasses, it reflects uh, uh, sun, and then, you know, it's not uh, good insulation. Plastic, everybody knows, is not environmental friendly. I don't have to repeat here. So these are the modern materials that are not environmental friendly, okay? So conclusion. When you build a new building, you need new materials, right? When you need new materials, you need to have energy to produce them. And after you produce them, they are not environmental friendly. They cannot breathe. They destroy the buildings. They destroy the neighboring buildings. And there's a huge environmental impact. So, let's say if you build a building next door, okay, next to a heritage building or new buildings, okay, so this new building cannot breathe. You need air con. Okay, in install, in install aircon. And your aircon condenser, the heat will come out to the neighbor. The neighbor feels so hot. The neighbor has to install aircon. And then the neighbor, so this is the whole cycle of heat releasing to the environment and more air conditioning is required. Okay? 
So it's a bad cycle. Same thing, you need to have a lot of resources. You have to you know, do mining, you have to chop down a lot, make trees in order to provide new material for new construction. So is it called development? That's why the definition of development is very, very important, which I defined just now. So restoration save the environment because we don't need to use a lot of uh, new materials. The materials are recycled and heritage buildings are cooler. It helps in reducing global warming and the material used are organic. It doesn't help, it's not harm to the environment. So heritage conservation is a green development, it's a sustainable development, it leaves more natural resources for our future, future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, see the timer. <laughs> thank you very much, um, <laughs> Ms. Gaston, for your insightful information to underline that there is a lot of traditional knowledge and collective knowledge from our ancestors that was embedded in our um, built heritage architecture that, as Momo say, maybe um, authority or policy maker must have to take in, in, into consideration to make um, the future generation and future generations' buildings more sustainable for our society. Then coming up with our next speaker over here, we have Mr. Leandro Poco from the Philippines. Uh, Mr. Leandro is a Philippines uh, registered architect and environmental planner with an over 18 years of combined planning and architectural practice experience in both Manila and Singapore. He is eager to bring the evidence-based analytical and research method into practice and believes they are key in improving Asians dystopias. So we give a little time for our tech guy to open up our slide. In the meanwhile, I go through his presentation and I can say that this is one of the interesting um, topics <laughs> that we all can learn using some technology to explain um, heritage and the heritage of urban area in different cities. So I will pass the mic to Midalian. Thank you. Uh it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I would like to build off of the George Todd. Hello? Hello? Yeah. I would like to build off of the, the Georgetown talk by expounding uh, that the World Green Bu Building Council finds that the built environment accounts for up to 39% of worldwide carbon emissions. But this doesn't actually account for the effects of car-centric sprawl and city regions like Metro Manila and, I guess, metropolitan Bangkok. Nor does it account for the inequities of space, opportunities, and amenities that accompanies these disparities in socio-spatial uh, allocation. So new urbanism was developed, I think, back in the late 90s as a toolkit of best practices for retrofitting suburbs and developing new communities to reduce sprawl. Though it, uh, critiqued, uh, it is critiqued widely uh, as uh, largely historicist and merely another way of planning rich gated communities uh, for car riders, thereby legitimizing sprawl. So these are examples of uh, these new urbanist communities and you can see that there's still cars <laughs> all over the place. And a lot of this is just romantic revivalism of historical buildings. Uh, this is in Celebration, Florida. <clears throat> Now, the COVID-19 pandemic induced lockdowns that highlighted how far people have to move to make a living. Uh, this gave rise to the 15-minute city discourse, which is seen as a natural extension of new urbanism. Uh, the stalwarts of new urbanism, uh, the firm of DPZ, uh, are just one of the many who put forward thought pieces based on the 15-minute walking and cycling uh, transit travel shed for planning. But one can see that travel sheds are not actually perfect circles uh, because travel coverage from a point relies on the accessibility of the street network around that point. So unless you're a bird, you don't travel on a perfect radius around, around that point. Travel sheds are actually uh, based uh, highly reliant on the street network surrounding a certain area. So uh, it, it's a good concept, but it's, it, it loses translation when you actually apply it in the actual urban fabric. So my paper aims to nuance new urbanism and 15-minute city discourse beyond historical revival aesthetics and forms and uh, circular travel sheds uh, by using space syntax to understand and rediscover Metro Manila's old urbanism. The aim is to apply uh, space syntax and to highlight how to retrofit our existing city regions for sustainability and resilience. 
So that's the introduction. I'm going to walk over some uh, concepts in space and tax just to, just to give you a, a rough idea of what this is all about. And I'll, I'll go over the research findings. The heart of space and tax is how space can be represented as actual lines, straight, drawn as the straightest, longest lines that pass through any space. So actual lines, if you walk through the city, you actually see things as actual lines because you've moved in straight lines because our eyes are mounted in front of our heads. So each street or space is represented as an actual line and then it's counted as a node, which is then grouped together according to their connections and then analyzed using mathematics. So uh, space syntax is actually graphical, uh, graphically applied network theory. <clears throat> so the analysis of the spatial network highlights centralities that are most useful in the analysis of cities. So there are two main centralities that we're gonna focus on, the closeness centrality and the between the centrality. The closeness centrality is the part of the network that is the most uh, easiest to get to. Uh, it's the closest destination. So if you live in a neighborhood, there's usually a corner shop that most people will head to. And usually that street corner has a lot of coffee shops. And there's a reason why the coffee shops congregate there, because it's the closest to everything else. Now, there's also the between the centrality. There are certain roads in a network that get really clogged with traffic because there's a certain degree of path dependency and you have no choice but to pass through that, that road to get from one side to the other. So space syntax allows us to strip away all the layers of the city and look at the underlying spatial configuration that tends to drive human interaction. Is it determinist? Not really. It's more prob probab uh, probabilist if there's such a thing. Uh, and uh, unlike, I mean, as a, a little bit contrary to the, to the prior uh, talks, uh, this strips away the semantics and the semiotics and just looks at the pattern, uh, underlying pattern. And then you start rebuilding it back and you start realizing, ah, there's a reason why these meanings are there in the first place. So uh, it, it's been useful for archaeologists to discover socio-spatial no knowledge that's in, embedded in archaeological sites because there's no written record about how these spaces were used in the past. Uh, it's usually very ceremonial, but you don't have a clue on the daily life of these inhabitants. So the first important key, key concept of space and tax is called natural movement. Basically, what it says is that uh, the more accessible you are, the more likely you're going to get traffic. So that's natural movement. So without any uh, fancy modeling, uh, they're able to see that 72%, uh, rough 60 to 72% correlation of the network with the actual traffic count in, in cities like Tianjin and other countries. The second key concept is called movement economies. So naturally, where there's more footfall or more vehicular traffic, businesses will want to set up there. So that's a movement economy. There's also an adverse movement economy because when more businesses and more people are there, the more victims of crime you can have. So the movement economy goes positive or negative. It can go both ways. And uh, lastly, it also highlights what is an imposed order versus an underlying structure. So let's say in university campuses, when you have lawns, people walk across them, that structure. But when you impose an order, like when you define a certain grid, but people won't walk on the walkways, the, that's, that's an imposed order. So it's been very helpful in understanding uh, Iran's ancient cities because a lot of these centralities that form in Iran's ancient cities actually correlate to where the bazaars are, where their uh, ancient bazaars and marketplaces are. So where, where things are accessible, commerce usually tends to congregate. So these are the research questions. I'll just go, go over them quickly and answer them. This is the nerdy slide for the methodology. Uh, basically, I'm covering Metro Manila from 1851 to 1899, uh, 1905, 1935, 1946, and so on. It's a lot, but I'm going to wrap through everything. So this is Intramuros. Uh, this is the map of uh, Manila, downtown Manila, uh, back in the Spanish period. And you can see that the walled city of Intramuros was founded by the Spanish. Uh, it's a reproduction of uh, the uh, European town following the loss of the Indies. And you can see that uh, it follows a Cartesian grid. And um, there's, there's a, a fortress uh, surrounding it with a certain entrance gates. We modeled this in, into space syntax and we're able to highlight that a lot of the 
civic structures are actually primarily located in the most accessible parts of the grid inside. If you were a citizen or a resident, if you were a Spanish colonist, this is the world that you knew because everything else outside is cool in a, color, in a cooler gradient. Everything is happening in the heart of the city. Everything that's peripheral is, is coming out at a cooler gradient. So the higher the value, the more accessible it is. <clears throat> But if you, if you model accessibility outside of Intramuros in the 1898 map, you'll see that actually the mission churches uh, that were founded by the Spanish have higher accessibility values for pedestrians. And you can see that a lot of the white dots that are planted all over, these are the churches, are actually, they actually have higher accessibility values because their, the Spanish intention was to uh, Christianize everybody. <laughs> so they wanted to bring the churches close to the people as possible. Now, the, the interesting thing is Intramuros was the colonial center, but you can see that it's actually the least accessible. It's, it's placed in the center, but no roads lead to it. All the roads uh, lead to Binondo, which actually is the world's oldest Chinatown, because the Spanish didn't want the Chinese traders beside them. They relocated them in Binondo, and by happenstance, Binondo becomes the central hub of the spatial network. So the, the imposed order of Intramuros being in the center falls apart because it's actually Binondo that is the, the main hub of the city. Now, uh, okay. in 1905, I mean, in, uh, uh, when the Spanish-American turnover happened, which so all of a sudden we became an American uh, colony, um, Daniel Burnham prepared the Burnham uh, plan for Manila, and his objective was to unify the Spanish city and expand it with a radial concentric grid uh, from a ceremonial core. So you have a nice downtown uh, civic core here that, that, that's a bit like Washington, D.C. <laughs> so I'm, we modeled that, uh, and you could see that what Burnham creates is actually a very diverse network of grids. And all of these little uh, accessible neighborhoods are interconnected walk, uh, th by walking through the diagonals. What, what this makes is a very walkable, interconnected city. It's fine-grained. And if you can walk from five minutes and uh, string together five-minute walks, you can go from the edge to the core of the city very easily. Now, but the irony here is that because of this Burnham grid, it's, uh, it actually sucks away the uh, integration core of the city, away from the downtown. So again, the attempt to create a civic core is an imposed order, but it falls apart because all the action actually migrates to the north and south of the Pasig River, which it's a consequence of the density of the grid uh, in, in, in those areas. <clears throat> now, in 1945, uh, that's actually the tail end of uh, American colonial rule. Manila reaches, it's like a peak uh, colonial city building, and you can see that this uh, foreshadowing of a segregation in the north and south actually happens. So you could see that the, the network divides and segregates to northern and southern cores. And this is partly a consequence of the lack of bridges spanning the Pasig River and the large amount of uh, industrial land that had to be allocated beside the river. So that segregated the north and south sides. And interestingly, this is a little bit detailed, but I'll just go over it quickly. You know, uh, the accessibility of the southern uh, southern side is actually higher than the northern side, and this points to how this southern side is called the Bayfront area. This happens to be like a gated enclave, an ungated enclave of uh, the Americans. So all the yellow dots are all the institutions that the Americans founded and the American businesses. They were all founded in the most prime addresses of the city. And this sort of points to how uh, the spatial network is actually more accessible in those areas. Now, uh, in 1967, uh, this is the first metropolitan survey of Metro Manila. And you see that there's a planned uh, circumferential road called EDSA. So if you've ever visited Metro Manila, EDSA is this mega infrastructure that you will probably encounter in, during your visit. And in 1967, all the accessibility values actually are now higher than what was in the core. 
it signals the suburban migration of the vitality of the city, literally sucking out the, the vibrancy of the core to the edges. And that edge actually happens to be the most vehicular-centric, because it's all suburban planning. <clears throat> so a lot of the development happening on the edges is actually very car-centric. So on the north, you have the new government city called Quezon City. This was planned as a heroic city for the workers with a lot of civic monuments. But the funny thing is, if you go into Quezon City, no worker can walk because it's all very inaccessible. <laughs> and, then, and then on the south is uh, Makati, which is the CBD. It's a private business township. It's a private business district that's surrounded by uh, gated communities, by gated elite subdivisions and villages. So, this leads to contemporary Metro Manila centralized suburban sprawl. So, you can see that the land uses are all concentrated in the core, but everything else outside is all residential. Yellow is residential. Um, but using space syntax to analyze the Metro Manila fabric, you can actually see that a lot of small centralities form outside of the core. These are opportunities for a reconfiguration and a relocalization of, of the city. And if you zoom in into Southern Metro Manila, this is the existing land use. It's all residential. All the commercial is on ribbon developments or strodes. And you can see that inside the residential developments, there are centralities that are untapped. Why? Because a lot of these areas are segregated and are prevented from, using, from having commercial land use. So these are all gated um, elite residential suburbs. Now, uh, space and tax highlights this and allows us now to revision what those travel walking sheds are. Essentially, when, when you talk about the 15-minute city, these red areas, these walkable centralities could be the core of these uh, new 15-minute city bubbles. Uh, so. I hope I was able to show how space and tax can be used to translate that idea, that very rough schematic idea, into actual planning. I'm actually using this in my practice also. Thank you. So thank, thank you very much, Leanne, for explaining us these um, alternative tools for analyzing activity of um, the city so that we can understand what's ha actually happening in the urban area. So if you guys have a question, please hold on to that, including you who is watching online. We will be having our Q&A after all of the speakers have been finished. So our next speaker over here, welcome. We have Dr. Nirmal Kishnani, who has been at the front line of sustainability, advising on projects and policy in Asia, formulating new platforms and um, um, scunits scrutinizing the space between frontline theory and design practice. Presently, Dr. Kishnani is the associate professor at the university, at, at the National University of Singapore's um, College of Design and Engineering, where he teaches sustainable design. So Dr. Nirma Kishnani, please. Great, thank you. Are we um, gonna find a way to start this? Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Siam Society. Um, now for something completely different. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about the work of one architect, Huang Tak Hao, um, in the context of Vietnam. Uh, his work um, represents the urban-rural divide, uh, giving voice to the many communities that are left behind in the countryside. Um, his work is also representative of a new Vietnamese sustainability, uh, sensibility he adapts a vernacular architectural form to contemporary realities. It is this act of interpretation, this intersection between the traditional and modern uh, that Mr. Howe finds his voice. Uh, his work also implicitly acknowledges the exigencies of our time, uh, environmental problems, and social inequity. Uh, before I begin on the presentation proper, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Alakesh Tata, who's not here, who is also a colleague at the National University of Singapore. So, uh, as 
covered by the previous speaker, rapid urbanization uh, has been declared the root of uh, many of today's problems. Uh, here we see an uh, aerial view of uh, Mom the city of Mumbai uh, by photographer Johnny Miller. And it so graphically demarcates the city into uh, social spaces, the, the blue patch to the left, uh, the slums, the uh, buildings to the right are your upper middle class houses, and to the far left, a polluted river. Uh, the failure of infrastructure uh, to keep up with population growth uh, has led to uh, an increase in environmental risk. This image of um, floodwaters in Bangkok um, is a familiar sight across uh, Southeast Asia in cities in uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. So we, in the building construction sector, we ask ourselves what can buildings and urbanism do to mitigate the risk of some of these problems. So we're seeing um, a response to the environmental issues uh, around us uh, here in the work of architects like Singapore-based Woha, uh, who advocate that buildings should be uh, seen as constructed ecosystems. So this is a, a mixed-use tower in the, in the heart of Singapore, which has a green wall that rises over 100 meters and has become a habitat uh, for small animals and birds. Or here, uh, we see in the work of Thai landscape architect, uh, and I'm going to say the name, I'm going to do my best, and I apologize to my Thai colleagues, um, Kochakon Vorakom. Kochakon. Kochakon, okay, got it. Um, who uses large uh, landscape uh, projects to create new social and ecological relationships. So while cities um, struggle um, with um, the influx of people, we see the hollowing out of the countryside, uh, small villages and towns where um, there is disrepair. The Vietnamese, in the Vietnamese context, the Doi Moi policy in the 80s and 90s um, led to a progressive migration of people from villages into the country, into the city. In um, every year, for example, 100,000 people move to Hanoi, 130,000 to Ho Chi Minh City, uh, and this is a problem for both the city and the countryside at large. So Huang Tak Hao um, was born in 1971, trained in Hanoi and in Italy. He's currently based in Hanoi where his firm, uh, One Plus One is More Than Two, um, focuses on community architecture. Um, he's, he sort of fashioned himself as something of a community architect, uh, uh, focusing on buildings, uh, small, uh, um, uh, community buildings in the, in the countryside. There's something um, special about his approach, this blending of uh, traditional form and craft uh, and materiality uh, with a unique sort of modern twist. I'll very quickly show you a few images before I talk about um, the principles of his work. Um, here is Kham Tham uh, Community Center outside of Hoi An in central Vietnam. Um, this is the Jungle Flower School in Vona District, uh, which is a mountainous area north of Hanoi. Nam Dan Homestay and Community House in the Quang Ba District, uh, northwest of uh, Hanoi, um, on the border of China, and the Ta Pin uh, Community House in the Sapa District, which is a famous tourist area. So, Huang Tak Hao is very much an activist, an agent of change. He's often the initiator of the projects. He defines, he solicits and defines needs and finds the funding for the projects. The buildings are as much a product of process as they are the subjectivities of architectural thinking. Um, in each project, he brings uh, multiple stakeholders and uh, resources, and these include members of the community. Uh, a lot of what happens on site is driven by um, both the, the, the community themselves, but also the craftsmen that do the building in the final. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about his process in the context of one specific project, uh, the uh, Earth Village in Nam Dan. Um, so um, since 2013, uh, Huang Tak Hao began collaborating with an NGO in Vietnam to lend his design skills to a particular problem. And this problem had to do with an existing village in the mountains 
which, had, which was struggling from a loss of income um, through the migration of people out of the, out of the village. Uh, and so they had to relocate the entire village <laughs> uh, to further downslope, closer to infrastructure where they could create new business model where the village would live off tourism. Um, so it was a relocation of an entire community. Now, key to the redevelopment of this village was creation of this new lifestyle of tourism. And so many houses had to be redesigned um, for, to include accommodation for paying visitors. Um, the buildings are uh, very highly crafted, uh, made with local material and by local craftsmen. Um, in the discourse of architecture, we often talk about place making. Um, uh, the, the term place is specific to the discipline of architecture, which refers to this, this combination of social, cultural, climatic attributes of a location that give rise to an architecture that feels as if it belongs where it is and that it is embedded in its place. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that Huang Tak Hao uses to bring forth the idea of place, starting with the emphasis on the tropical roof. Um, the, uh, dating back to the 80s, um, when we first began to seriously uh, bring tropicality into the regionalist discourse, uh, the roof was celebrated as a form, as a giver of identity. Yeah? Um, so Pang Tak Hao is very much in the tradition of that. Um, here in, um, in, in, in the Namdan uh, community, in Earth Village, he adapts traditional forms to contemporary ideas so that it's unmistakably uh, vernacular inspired, but you can see in the, in the shape of the roof that there is a slight peculiarity, a little twist that makes it also unmistakably modern in its sensibilities. Um, here in the uh, Jungle Flower School, um, the architecture mimics the profile of the landscape. Um, and the second important thing that um, Huang Tak Hao does is to acknowledge the significance of the, um, the space between the indoor and outdoor. Tropical architecture has long been distinguished by the idea of the semi-outdoor space, the courtyard, the veranda, so on. And so Huang Tak Hao is very much a master in reinterpreting these ideas. Um, here you see in the Kam Dan uh, community house, um, the courtyard um, with the deep uh, pitch roofs. I mean, I, I think that what's um, really interesting about um, his interpretation of it, which is very different from, for example, uh, the, the presentation you saw earlier about the shop house in Penang, is that there is this idea that um, there is a pragmatic to it, which is uh, about creating comfort and about creating protection and shelter. But there is also this kind of exquisite idea of discomfort, <laughs> if you will. You know, that, that there are parts of the building where if it rains heavily, you get wet. You know, there is joy in that. And sometimes um, he, in, in the sections, you see this exaggeration of line and structure, uh, which both speaks to porosity, but also speaks to um, an attention to the edge between the inside and the outside. Um, one of the things that um, uh, is very interesting about his work is that even though he's dealing with very basic uh, structures, he brings an environmental uh, outlook into them. Uh, and so um, I, I, I didn't put this into the slides, but uh, very often he will do uh, energy modeling. He'll do light daylight modeling uh, to look at how these buildings are performing before they're completed. Yeah. And, um, a big part of what he conceptualizes is also the connectivity of the elements, so how rainwater is collected, how it gets stored, and then it gets reused. So I, I personally think that his work is filled with these many um, sublime moments uh, where the relationship to nature, the outside world, um, interacts or blends in with the inner sanctum of um, shade, shelter, and privacy. And all of these, there is one other very important ingredient, which is materiality. Uh, he showcases an amazing ability to handle local materials. He's uh, very much a master of the low impact materials, such as rammed earth, uh, stone, 
uh, adobe bricks, timber, etc. Um, and most of what he does is built by local craftsmen. So there is this kind of implicit in the construction process and upgrading of the skills that uh, are in that industry at that place. Um, I think um, he's incredibly, he's been incredibly successful um, in, in the way that he's um, uh, brought materiality into the conversation. And in some ways, the materiality of his architecture speaks to the question of environment. So low impact materials, uh, very much in the vogue right now, we talk about rammed earth and brick and stone, um, but he, he uses them uh, to contemporary effect. Um, and finally, I think um, one of the, uh, the unique characteristics of his work is his use of cultural motifs. Uh, here you see him using a, um, uh, in the Tapin uh, community house, he uses the pattern of the, um, the, the, the scarf, or the women's headgear of this, uh, of this small community in the north of uh, Vietnam uh, to kind of um, echo that in, in the creation of his architecture. So I, like every uh, successful architect, um, he, um, he's had to um, move out of his comfort zone. <laughs> he gets commissions now uh, from peri-urban and urban projects. Um, and what we see is a continuity of ideas uh, here in the Da Hop Kindergarten and Primary School. Uh, on the outskirts of, um, of uh, Hanoi, uh, you see the, the use of form as a way of echoing uh, topography, uh, the landscape. Um, we also see in the, um, in the porosity of form the same kind of um, intent with regard to passive design, the, the introduction of courtyards, uh, of air wells and um, uh, light shafts. As he moves, um, into even more dense urban settings. They become even more challenging uh, because the city is, unlike the countryside or even peri-urban areas, uh, can be uh, inhospitable. It can be polluted, it can be noisy. And so the idea of the building open to the world around it has to be reimagined. Um, here in the Institute of Mathematics, uh, Advanced Study of Mathematics in Hanoi, uh, we see the um, uh, the, the, the courtyard, the inner sanctum, uh, repeated with the vegetation now becoming very much a part of the vocabulary of the architecture. Uh, so the courtyard becomes a kind of an urban oasis here, uh, becoming a way of shielding uh, residents from the noise and the pollution of the city. Um, he's even had um, commissions in downtown Hanoi, uh, which uh, because of the brief and the site uh, are even more demanding. And so the idea of the courtyard here flips uh, to the idea of the tropical veranda in the sky. Um, this is uh, Dream Residences. Uh, it's a hotel and apartment on a small site in Hanoi where the architecture attempts to create elements that are found in nature on its roof and on facades. The vegetation here is used uh, to counter urban density. This brings both uh, value to both the occupants of the building and to the neighborhood. The last of his projects that I, I wanna showcase is the um, Batrang uh, Pottery Museum, which was completed recently. Um, this is uh, on the outskirts of Hanoi. Um, I, think, um, I think every successful architect eventually gets to do a museum. Um, seems to be the bane of my profession. Uh, but um, so how does um, uh, an architect who built his reputation on small community architecture do this grandiose kind of iconic structure? Uh, well, obviously, he, he carried through some of the ideas of courtyards and uh, uh, vertically distributed greenery into the building. But uh, here, he, he veers towards the cultural object, the, the idea of the building as a kind of a mimicking the act of making pottery. So I clearly, I, I think um, uh, the work of how um, attempts to address the specifics of the countryside and the city, the challenges that are faced, 
what is interesting in his reliance of these traditional forms and strategies and this reinvention of the vernacular is that he's even able to carry it forward into the city. Um, so his, his, um, the, vo the, the vocabulary has expanded from these very small intimate structures to larger urban conditions. And I think we're beginning to see this kind of unifying thread that suggests that maybe, just maybe, this idea of the urban-rural binary, this, this dichotomy that we're becoming so used to talking about, is perhaps more imagined than it is real. That the, the, what happens in the city is very much contingent on what happens in the countryside, uh, and what lessons we learn from the things that we do in the countryside have a role, part to play in, in the way that we design in the city. Um, I'm going to end with a quote uh, from uh, Rahul Mehotra. Uh, Rahul is an urbanist from India. He's a professor, uh, also is a professor in Harvard Graduate School of Design. So I interviewed Rahul for my podcast, uh, Ecogradia, and uh, we talked about the future of the city. Yeah. Um, actually, um, the thing that Rahul says here, uh, I've heard from quite a lot of thought uh, leaders in this, in this area. Um, and I, I'm just going to quote what he says. He says that there is a lot of flux with climate change, climate migration, and this is going to be accelerated in different ways. Um, he was referring um, most recently to what happened in India during the pandemic when um, millions of people literally had to walk home to their, uh, to their homes in the countryside. Um, um, and that the idea that as people migrate to the city, um, they leave behind their homes and their, their histories uh, is imagined. Yeah? And he says that it will not be a clear urban versus rural, a rural versus urban. In fact, the rural urban bi binary, in my view, is a useless category um, that we have to begin to look at um, uh, development, human settlements, in a more polycentric way. So the conversation that we're having about, oh, you know, how much more can we pack into the city? How are we going to do mega cities? Um, the future is a polycentric one. It's not going to be these big metros. It's going to be a network of cities, towns, and villages kind of coexisting um, with these flows and exchanges that happen between them. In case you want to hear more, and I will, uh, I will do a shameless pitch here. Uh, I, I, I'm having a blast of a time interviewing people on my podcast. So uh, people like Rahul and uh, Huang Tak Hao, who are thought leaders in their in their field, please join me anytime you want. Um, Ecogradia. Thank you. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kishnani, for your insightful information on this architect work and also how to extract traditional knowledge and how to interpret it into the modern urban world. So coming up with the last speaker of our panel, um, last but not least, we have um, Mr. Sibara, Sibarani um, Sofian, who is a passionate urban designer, planner, and a business leader with extensive experience in various urban projects in Asia, especially Southeast Asia and Indonesia. He focuses on executing sustainable urban development based on an integrated multidisciplinary approach. Uh, he also initiated the formation of the Indonesian Urban Design Institution in 2019. It, for which he is now serving as a president. So, all to you. Okay, thank you very much, Sukicha, uh, for the kind introduction, uh, fellow speakers and moderators, and also the uh, participants of this exciting uh, talks yeah, and seminars. So, uh, my name is Ibrani Sofian, and you probably aware about the new capital city relocation that's probably something that i will talk about a lot and this is going to be again another different directions from the various speakers in here some talking about the shop houses some talking about the city expansion in the sort of like huge modeling space syntax and another one uh, rural architecture and i think i'm gonna work on another scale and this is a, a huge effort and uh, titled uh, New Direction, Culturally Inspired Urban Forms of Indonesia Capital City Nusantara. 
And I'm here to actually learn together with you because I'm very much inspired by the, uh, the, the terms or the, the phrase that the Reverend Anil mentioned about this morning, uh, this afternoon, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's one thing that change, uh, con that constant is change. So you're gonna see a lot of changes. You're gonna see also a lot of the changes in different scale, different topics, and also different probably execution of how this uh, new capital city will be, will be coming. So um, back in 2019, our president, uh, Joko Widodo, decided to move our new capital city to uh, Borneo. Again, this is not a very popular topic in this room, especially talking about Borneo as the lung of the world, home for probably, I don't know whether tigers live or, there or not, <laughs> sir, probably if we if we coming in there, uh, moving all the tigers to another place, that's going to be a disaster. But don't blame me on this because this is a political move that our president already made. It's been decided, Borneo is the place. And our fellow Malaysian, uh, watch out, we're going to come into your board border <laughs> because we are uh, in the border to Kuching and Sarawak, yeah? So, um, but there are three uh, pillars of the vision uh, for our IKN that our president already uh, decided. First is about national identity. Another one, again, this is a very interesting thing, sustainability. I don't know whether our president really understand exactly what it means, yeah? We'll, we'll talk about that later. And also, it's a smart, modern, international standard city. So, all these three, if we are talking about in the, the terms of our uh, academic uh, sort of discourse, three very different directions. And today, what we are talking about here, whether this is going to be related to culture and heritage, I'm invited by uh, Professor Johannes Vidodo, and I was asked, uh, what I'm going to talk about in this forum because we're going to create everything new. So there's no history, there's no heritage on this. But later I realized that there is actually a good discussion that we can uh, bring up in here because the nature itself is heritage. And the culture itself is constant move. Uh, the, the culture that we have in the past could be something, the culture that we will adapt in the future. Talking about sustainability, we, uh, sustainability um, when we, uh, after the 2019, uh, the competition was done, and then he was happy that we have the winner, which is our scheme. Uh, in 13th of January, 2020, uh, our president, just right before the COVID, yeah, came to the Sustainability Week in Abu Dhabi. And this is the phrases that he uh, brought into the, <clears throat> to the uh, forum in that time in Abu Dhabi. Smart metropolis, 80% renewable energy, zero emission city, and then bringing the best, best technology and innovation forward with and the best wisdom and low carbon efficient pedestrian friendly city, all kind of what we call the wish list of a future city, all in one. And imagine that I have to deliver all this in one location with all the KPI within a very short limited time and showing that whether this is right or not. And I'm here to actually learn with you guys whether I'm in the right direction or not. Okay, let's see. <laughs> how, how much, how big failure did I make or not? So 2% temperature uh, reduction. This is coming to a little bit more quantifiable KPIs. 2% temperature reduction, 80% alternative energy, 70% green area. So compared to our lovely city of Jakarta, our lovely city is only having 9% and 11 million people. Uh, I don't know, that's Bangkok will probably in a better, better shape or not. Sometimes Jakarta probably worse. Uh, net zero emission, and there's a small little print in there, by 19, uh, 2060, and probably, I don't know whether it's going to be there or not. 10-minute cities. Uh, just now, uh, Leandro mentioned about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, we, we have 10 minutes, so we are better than that. <laughs> 10 minutes and 80% public transport. And for all those uh, urbanists here in this room, you know that all this KPI is not going to come together in one city. You can have a, sh a little bit here and there, but you cannot have it in one city. And my task is to bring this all and recipe into one city, yeah? So I don't know whether I'm gonna get there or not. So the location of our capital city, uh, I, I, sorry, I, if you are not familiar with uh, Borneo, 
uh, is in the East Kalimantan, is East Borneo. Uh, if you are aware about city of Balikpapan and Samarinda, so this is between the two. Uh, we call it a triangle city, and the area is 250,000 hectares. It's the size of the Jabo, the metropolitan Jakarta that has a people about 34 million. Uh, and then the red area in the middle is 60,000. It's about the size of Singapore Island. And the area of the red is actually the core of the capital city. In all, we're going to bring together a peak population of 1.8 to 2 million new residents. Balikpapan and Samarinda itself have roughly about 1 million, come bringing together about 3.8 to 4 million uh, population of people. So bear in mind, this is not Jakarta. And capital city of uh, uh, Nusantara is not going to be uh, a re relocation of Jakarta of 11 million people to that location. So it's going to be somewhat in the middle of the, the uh, population of that. So that's our design, Nagara Rimbanusa, and our president looked very uh, excitedly on that, uh, and our Minister of Public Works there. So that was in 2019. If you look closely, uh, it's near to the coast, and this is, again, uh, when I mentioned about changes, changes number one, change the location of your, uh, of your competition, because we, we think that it's near to the water, is uh, near to the climate change, so the water will be raising, the president's afraid that it's going to be flooded, just like our uh, uh, Jakarta uh, Palace was flooded in 2008. So move it up. Okay, so we'll move it up. Uh, but the, the idea of the uh, Nagara Rimba Nusa, probably you, uh, one may ask, Nagara means state, Rimba means forest, Nusa means archipelago. If you ask the Indonesian here, what does it mean? It, it means nothing because it doesn't actually <laughs> even create a phrases, you know. <laughs> Nagara Rimanusa is just a brand name, but it encapsulates three different things. That the city is going to be there. We cannot deny the fact that we're going to bring in a full flat city with all the system in it. But it is very much happened in the area of the jungle. But just to bear in mind, it's not really a primary virgin jungle. It's actually a productive production forest, yeah? So in every three years, the, the, the tree is going to be have to uh, 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 forested, I mean, uh, uh, crop and uh, new plants will come in. So this is, this is not necessarily, you know, the area where we actually have the orangutan and or the bekantans living. So the government already picked a, or area that is actually not near to that. And the archipelago is basically coming in together as our identity as the most, the largest archipelagic country in the world. And initially we wanted to be in the, in the in near to the water, but now they, we move up to another location, then we have to bear with the archipelago in the different uh, definition, yeah? But uh, the idea of Nagarari Manusa is basically having a city that is cause access with the nature, which is forest, in Kalimantan or Borneo, which is known as their Rimba or the forest, in the very unique identity of Indonesian, because we are archipelagic country, there should be something to do with uh, our uh, identity. And there's also the word of transformative and inspirative, because it's part of the brief, it needs to be a transformative and inspirative. Now, what would be the, you know, the shape and the look of these future-looking cities and with all the KPIs that we have. This is our several winners, yeah? The first one on the left is actually predates me. That was the first brief that was done by uh, somebody that I cannot mention. But it was done even with, without any site. So it's just an uh, imaginary city for creating certain level of concept. And it looks very much like, I don't know, uh, you know, the, the five, uh, they call it Bapomet, right? <laughs> it looks like the, the five different, but, but that's probably related to our five rules of Pancasila yeah, in Indonesia. And the other one is called uh, Infinite City, the second winner. The third winner is called Kota Seribu uh, Layar or Seribu Rajutan. Yeah? It's, all, it's a network of a city. Uh, uh, of layered city. So what you can see is 
there are various options, there are various shapes that you can actually arrive to a different solution, but responding to the same uh, brief. So all the brief is the same. So the, the hypothesis that we want to have in here is, to what extent the heritage culture of Indonesia, urban form and architecture, could bring forward the new direction of the future developments? And we hope that the IKN design in here kind of like respond to all this for sustainable and smart city, but also try to develop a new uh, future develop urban forms that I'm, I'd like to really uh, learn from everyone in this room. So I'm going to be quickly moving into the, the material. So the location that you can see in here is pretty much what the Borneo looks like. Borneo has a very distinct uh, characteristic. There is no volcanic activity. There is no uh, mountain that is too high, but there are very annoying bumps. Small little bumps in the, this kind of level. It's not very noticeable, but when you are in there, it's actually pretty pretty strong. So you can see a 20 to 30 meter difference in every 100 meter you move. For a developer, it's a nightmare, right? So, but then our government decided, let's move it there because we like it to be on the mountainside, although it's not really a mountain. We don't like the water, although we are archipelago country. So, uh, so we, are, we are asked to, changes number one is to ask to move up to the, to the hill. So, uh, but then the response that we have that we need to uh, start to build in is how we start to bring in the language of the archipelago, the language of our natural terrain, we call it tanah air the land and the, and, the, and the water that is bringing our life. But then at the same time, we have a tradition of creating a, an axis. Indonesian, we have the cosmological axis and we'll explain to you later about it. But then this is just to show you how we are dealing with the contour without really changing the landscape too much, introducing a new type of axis that also have the vertical pillars of our cultural uh, representation of our 34 provinces. You're probably aware Indonesia has 17,000 islands and we have hundreds of languages. We have very different people from the east to the west, north to the south. So we have to represent that into one space. Coming back to, the, to the, what the, will be the, the cosmology, the microcosmos concept uh, of uh, Indonesian uh, old uh, vernacular spaces yeah as uh, in the in the past we believe that uh, the way the traditional architecture responds is related very much with the nature but when it comes to the independence time we start to leave those wisdom we start to leave the way we relate to the nature uh, then we start to create a modern city and that's where the things start to go pretty bad yeah but then coming back to this uh, concept of there's something defined, there's something that is important, there's something that is beyond us that needs to be placed in the, in the, in the, in the, in the different sort of like sets of uh, spaces uh, where us human are in the bottom and the nature and the higher uh, create this kind of like a primary and secondary aspect of life that we have that written up in many uh, of our uh, uh, cultural heritage relics, in even the, the axis of the city is being also defined. And it's part of our various cities in the Indonesia. You name it, you can come it from Bali, you can come from a uh, uh, city in Java, uh, the, uh, sometimes even in, in the island of uh, uh, Nusa Tenggara, you, you see this kind of relationship to the mountain, you can see relationship to the ocean. And people relate that very well. And that's something that we want to bring into the new capital city. And that's also bring us to the next level of how the roof and the architecture of Indonesian uh, archipelago, although we are in the different island, we have a similarity. We, we treat our roof very specially, uh, be it from the Borneo itself, or uh, it, to the Toraja, and also to the Sumatra. Uh, we have what we call the the separation between the ground level, that's where we relate to the human, uh, between the human and the animal. Sometimes a domesticated animal, is, uh, like our cattle, etc., was placed at the bottom. You can work with the water, water can flow in. We live on the second floor anyway. 
and then we have the roof to create a lot of the uh, uh, learning from uh, Penang, also from the Vietnam architect. It's where the insulation, that's where the climate is actually factored in. So we have what we call the architecture of the head, the body, and the, and the uh, foot, yeah? And how this relate to our uh, uh, architecture and also the urbanism of the capital city, uh, we try to uh, emulate this into the uh, design of that. So the smart forest city that uh, we propose in here is basically a forest and archipelago based future city model as a transformation symbol and civilization and advancement of Indonesia. So if you look at this, it's, really, it's located in the rolling hills. The urbanism has to start to work with that. The water is around us, needs to be, to be captured. And let's open it layer by layer. That's the kind of topography that I have been working for the past three years. It's actually, and during the COVID time, yeah, when we did it, it, it drives me nuts, actually, because <laughs> we have no uh, computer. Uh, we don't have any team because we work in the room. And I have to deal with this very annoying undulation. But then we have to relate this with the sensitivity by keeping the high ground and also letting the flood area and the sea level rise uh, free, and we don't touch those areas, we go painstakingly identify the, not only the big one, but also to the smallest riparian order to allow the urbanism to come in. We cannot have any grid. We have all this mm, sort of like uh, meandering road, uh, unlike the, the first one that we show. We start to bring in this sort of like urban structure where we have the higher up, the defined define, uh, power, and also the middle one is the human and the nature at the south. And then we create also this sort of uh, a green corridor where we allow the animal and the water to pass through. Uh, we also have this so-called 70% uh, green area, 30% develop by creating a green and blue fingers painstakingly uh, carving in the, the, the green system into the neighborhood, allowing the breeze and the water and the, uh, and the wind to pass through. And at the same time, we try to also bring in certain level of dynamics, livability, and also inclusiveness within the area of a transit-oriented poly polycentric city. So we create, bring in the public transport 10 minutes and 15 minutes, uh, sort of like a radia, and trying to bring in uh, what we call a polycentric transit-oriented city based on the 10-minute walks, while we also still identifying the greenery around us in the undulating nature and trying to create this uh, diversity and, and the mix within that very uh, compact area. So uh, I'm just gonna very quickly pass through. So this is something that we will bring in uh, the uh, nationalism into our axis. We also try to bring a building that is mimicking the nature. So we call it uh, biomimicry. So architecture of the building try to, uh, to mimic what the nature uh, look like. And we also try to bring in the ground level uh, by piloti, bringing up the building and allowing the breeze to come in and also trying to create a certain level of wind to come in and work with the nature, with, with the slope and also the verandas and all those kind of architecture elements that we have to in the in the system. Yeah, and the Indonesian we don't have a lot of pedestrian next to the building. If you look at the new building in Indonesia, in the old past yes we do, but in the new architecture we are always having a setback. So we try to bring that set back now to the, to the main street level. And then we try to also bring in uh, medium density. We don't actually bring in high density building. Uh, and we try to relate also with the main street uh, issues uh, because Indonesian live on uh, a lot of the Indonesian urbanism uh, in the Kampung, especially in the Kampung, we live on the road. We, social road is our social space. So emphasis on the road system in our uh, public system, public uh, housing is also uh, identified. 
So what we have as a ending of this is, what do you think the city look like in the 50 to 100 years? Will we see the same character of the city in the future? Does culture, geography, or climate significance have a significance uh, in the city will survive without them? Now, the, the changes that I want to make sure, mention also the last is, so this is the changes that happen on the ground today. And if you look at this, the way this is being implemented is not necessarily the way it's designed. So this is another changes that I'm surprised. As a planner, we sit in the room, we, we put a heavy sort of like expectation to what needs to be done, but because of the time, budget, and quality, the three things that never be in the same place, you want to get quality building, you need to have time and you need to have a good budget. But our government don't have time. We may have money, but we don't have time. So the rushness and the, 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 the order from the above that says you have to do it now is something that cannot be uh, managed easily and is done by many various parties. So the constant change that I have to deal with is to see how our plan has to adapt to what is that happening on the ground because sometimes what we design is not necessarily what is happening on the ground. And this is concerning everyone and I'm also uh, asking everybody's opinion about how to deal with this implementation issue uh, of setting up the, apart from the planning issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sofian, for this insightful uh, information <laughs> and to underline um, how, important, how important communication is needed between authority <laughs> heritage practitioner and everyone in this room also to give um, advice and also bring up some comments. Um, if you have already have questions in mind, I think we will start one by one, no, Momo? Yes. Uh I, I'm very, um, it's very interesting to hear that uh, the new city, totally new city to be built in somewhere else and I wish that the people willing to come to live to make a city very successful in the future. <laughs> and uh, I, shall we collect the, the questions from, from the from uh, one by one from, we do. Yes, from the speaker one about the Penang houses that uh, yeah. um. also um, if if, um, if you can share it to people that you know online and maybe there will be more of the, qu of the question coming up oh so we have our gentleman in the front row here with a with a question for um, Ms. Kexiang please this is Penang yeah uh, thank you Thank you, Pro. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Penang is uh, cultural heritage by UNESCO, right? Now, um, what criterions uh, of UNESCO? Because so many uh, typical cities like in Penang, not only in Penang, I think, you have Banda, Naira, in Indonesia, which is uh, being being exchanged to the Manhattan city um, <laughs> during the uh, the spicy uh, era uh, for the trading, and so what was criterion you you find? Uh, thanks for the question. Actually, it's not a, it's not a whole Penang as a UNESCO heritage site. Uh, as I explained on my PowerPoint, Penang consists of the island and the mainland. And on the island, there's only a small portion, 2.62 kilometers square is the UNESCO heritage site, which will fulfill the criteria number two, number three, number four. Yeah, but I don't have the list here, it's on the PowerPoint. Yeah, sorry. So thank you for your question. So is anyone else want to ask a question regarding the first presentation in our panel? Please raise your hand. Oh, you okay? Please. <laughs> Between the speaker, can we can we ask yeah, each sure. other questions? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miss Lim. I'm I'm very intrigued with the 
uh, Georgetown Transformation Project, right? I think it was called GTTP at one point. Uh, we were involved before. That's why we, we have, uh, as a consultant, yeah, before. Uh, one of the big question uh, of the uh, so-called revitalizing Old Town and having a UNESCO is how the business and the new economy come in into the old fabric that has so much limitation whether the success because at that time i think one of this recipe was to bring in certain level of creative and young generation and youth to come back to the old town was that successful at some point and how the architecture uh, and the development pattern can still take shape without compromising the heritage aspects thanks for the question actually uh, we have conducted a, a, a comprehensive in inventory of traditional trades, artisan and artists, artisan, yeah. uh, which uh, we cover 92 streets. In, this was conducted in 2012, 2010, yeah. because at that time we were telling the government that we need to keep the traditional trades, you know, instead of bringing new things inside. So the government was asking, how many? So that's why we, we did. So we sent 200 surveyors to do interview to every house, yeah. okay, interview them, and then in the end, we found there are 600 over traditional trees inside Georgetown Origin site. Unfortunately, nobody is stepping on that. So, so the I, the you know the, the other people have the idea that oh we should bring in new new things, new thing to the old city. But they forgot that they have to keep the. This is what why we are heritage sites. You know, we have to keep the old uh, traditional trees that in part of the intangible heritage that we have. And we are very sad that we have seen all this losing out. And then, you see, it, there's one thing interesting that people coming to Georgetown is because they like it's a heritage site. Yeah. They like the old Georgetown before listing. Correct. But then, after listing, we are chasing out, chasing the people away, and then try to replace with new thing. But that's not the thing that we like. So every time I got interviewed by the the reporters, I say, in the end, Georgetown will be like the tourists come and see the tourists, and not see the heritage. I'm sorry, uh, I don't think it's quite successful, that, that yeah, gentrification yeah. project, okay? And, but then we know that some of the uh, traditional sort of uh, carpenters and also the, the coffee shop uh, owners and also even the, the joystick makers, yeah. they are probably in their 90s now, right? Or 80s. Joystick maker has passed away. Yes. So, yeah, but the sun is uh, inheriting. Yeah. So I think the continuation of this living tradition yeah. is probably the challenge, right? Yeah, that's why we were proposing to the government that you, we need some uh, steps to protect them. Because I think the, the biggest challenge was rental. Yes. The rental. The you know, the prices of the heritage building has increased, increased 10 times. Increased by the tax, yes. 10 folds. That means rental increased by 10 times. So only left those people who own the owner, I mean the owner of the house, then they afford to stay. But then some of them thinking, oh, if I can only make two thousand dollar per month, why don't I rent it out at twenty thousand? Then I, I can you no know, shakes my leg. Yeah. You know, so there wasn't any protection. So I'm, yeah, this is a sad thing now. But I mean, today's topic, we talk, not talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So thank you very much for the question. Is there any other question for Ms. Xiang before we? Moving on, if there is no one, I have a question. Well, <laughs> as a, <laughs> well, as a heritage studies student, I always love to hear about heritage sites. So, because you, you mentioned in the slide that um, not every building that convey the outstanding universal value, so called, like because, of, because there is, of course, a lot of buildings in that area, but only the few were in, were in that were heritage site area, no? Uh, the the buildings that, what, that which was inscribed were only like in in different in, in different yeah in different number yeah of of the whole um, valuable building in Georgetown so I was wonder how development and um, protection goes in the Sorry, long term. Sorry, I don't get what you mean. Uh, there are five thousand over buildings yes. being in the and then there are three thousand eight hundred heritage heritage buildings. There's been categorized as category one and two heritage mm -hmm. buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are a lot, not not. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, but it, you you just said that only fifty two or something that it was recognized by the plan. Oh no 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 no. There's outside, outside. Georgetown ah, heritage okay. site, not inside. 
Right. Okay, inside World Heritage Site, there are 3,800 something. Mm. And then we, we expect there are more outside because inside is only 262 right. kilometers square. Mm. Outside is 295 minus 2.62, right? Yeah. So outside should be more, right? But then in the local plan, the consultant identified only 52. But outside. in my figure, yeah. it's 8,000 something that's outside. So, so it's still. It's not inside, it's outside, yeah. Uh, so it's still like also not under protection, right? Yeah, no. So you're asking about outside, inside now? The, the outside, outside also? Outside. No, 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 no. It's not gazetted, yeah. And then um, I just have a question also like all the um, building which is inside, this time it's inside, um, is it all public owner or like is it private ownership? Uh, private. Private. So um, how, how can you as like maybe because you're involved in the, how, let's say heritage conservation, how can architect and the owner of the building and authority like manage to meet and talk to 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 build, uh, let's say sufficient like let's say effective conservation with um the example that you put over there like the falling the replacing of the roof and also like the wall with the green with the limestone and everything is there okay, any okay these are the origin original materials being used mm -hmm. yeah so we don't rebuild we don't rebuild. So, but we restore them, okay, we don't rebuild. But then uh, uh, after we listed as UNESCO, actually we have the local city council. The local city council set up a panel called technical review panel, TRP. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of the panel members and then all uh, projects that for, I mean, any applications, you know, they have to apply. The owner want to apply if they want to restore the building, okay, they have to apply to the government or uh, they want to build a new building to apply. So all, all applications will come into the TRP for us to go through to approve. Uh -huh. So then we and we have made also a very thick special airplane and right. the in the special airplane we call SAP, the SAP the spell Bible. out what you can do and what you cannot do. Mm. So the SAP is the Bible as what I mentioned just yeah, now. It's our Bible. Bible. So every time we'll say according to the SAP, okay you only can build double story and not three story, something like that. So there's a, a, a very comprehensive guidelines there. Mm -hmm. And is yeah. there any plan to extend the area of the boundary of the? Oh, of course I want to. <laughs> because my you dream. It's a lot of them, so I was like, ooh. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, initially oh. when we started to do the UNESCO listing, we wanted uh, the original boundary is until there's a recall seven precincts, you know, See. and then until uh, they cover the the bungalows of yeah. Sultan Amasha, I mean Northern Road. But, but then we shrink it, you know. So now I want to, to lobby for tertiary zone. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can, can I ask also? Yeah, yeah, please, please, no. please. No. <laughs> because uh, we also have, uh, I think, one, two heritage, uh, world heritage uh, sites designated. But uh, what I feel is uh, when UNESCO has designated world heritage site, and then the, that somehow encourage the development because of the tourist attraction. So uh, being, being uh, designated as a World Heritage Site really helpful for the heritage conservation. Or my um, thinking is that actually if the local government or local people who really value their landscape, historic landscape, and with their own way of um, making this continue while also allowing people to stay on or to, uh, in, in their own places where they originated. There must be a way instead of a uh, world-class um, heritage site because I think uh, Penang is always struggling with that, the boundary, the number, um, the way of keeping the properties or the, the threats of being transformed or uh, gentrification. Uh, do you have any? Okay, actually uh, there's something, uh, you know, changes always happen, right? So when we were doing the UNESCO listing application, it was under one government and there were plans, you know, that we, we planned ahead. What should we do if we got listed to control the houses price, those sort of things? And uh, as UNESCO, the ECOMOS assessor came in 2007. He came, was under one government. And then the announcement made in 2008, 
but before the announcement, we changed government. So the government doesn't know what is happening with UNESCO. So he thought that they, the only thing that, oh, UNESCO World Heritage is about tourism, tourism, tourism. Yeah, it's unfortunate. So, and then uh, at the same time, I also advise her to the Teochew city in China. And uh, Teochew has a very intact heritage city that the people stay in there. So uh, they, the government invited me to give talk about World Heritage Site because they have interest. Of course, the first time I went, I told them what is a heritage site about. Second time I went, I give them injection vaccination. I said, before you do UNESCO listing, you must have your legislation, that means your law in place to protect all those things first. Otherwise, don't do UNESCO listing. That's my, that's my comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> So maybe we can move on yes. now. Oh, we have an online question for, okay. I am Apichai. Since the focus of this forum is, the, is on Southeast Asia and Indonesia has recently decided to build a new capital city. Now I can see that it's go to our yes. <laughs> on the fourth. Okay. Um, can we learn from other country in ASEAN uh, which had under which had undertaken such initiatives like Malaysia and Myanmar, and what issues can we can we draw from these um, precedences? Precedences. Well, do we have like a five hour for this um, panel or something? No, really. Uh, let me also inform you that we have planned to have uh, our tea, a coffee break in 15, uh, 10, 10 minutes. So we have about 12, 12 minutes. So okay. So on. maybe you can um, answer this. Oh, okay. So we can save this one. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes. So the second, our second panel, then like the second speaker of the panel, please. Um, is there anyone want to ask um, the the question to Lian? Fifteen minutes. Oh, you. Yeah. Okay. Our beautiful Sisha representative at the back. Youth representative. Here you go. I'm surprised that now technology get involved in more into the culture. My question to you is: What is your opinion of urban morphological analysis play a role on consistent the cultural patterns of living the traditional life of the local people? Uh, actually. This is a very good question. Um, urban morph morphological studies is actually very important. I had my grounding in urban morphology under uh, Dr. Johannes Widodo uh, at the NUS. Uh, and he was my dissertation advisor. And one of the things that he kind of helped me understand is how cities are like trees. Uh, they grow in layers. And there's always layers of meaning and historical uh, patterns that tend to repeat themselves, uh, except that if I were to present it fully, it would take a full hour or more. <laughs> so actually, the full, the full slide, the full paper, or my full dissertation, layers also those meanings in the type of morphology of Metro Manila. I just chose to highlight specifically the, uh, the fine-grained urban fabric related to pedestrianization. But I think... Um, the, that's why there's a danger that data science and uh, computational dynamics enters into planning without understanding the human element of, of urbanism. Uh, they, because they're generalists, they think they can march in into a domain and all of a sudden, ah, we know everything that has to be done. So that's where we have to hold the line and remind people that there are meanings to cities, there's semiotics, there's semantics, and, and that uh, cities uh, tell a story too. And part of preserving uh, the form of a city is also preserving the livelihoods, the economy, and uh, you know not just the structures, but the underlying uh, conditions that create the city. So uh, I love the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any more question for Lian? If not, we will uh, move on to. Oh, we do. I just want to add um, what uh, Dr. 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 Lindro has said. No PhD I, think if, if, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for the 15-minute box, I mean, you are trying to encourage that the people 
and more moving on using the street uh, and reaching out and more connection happening, con happening, right? So maybe the culture, I don't know, in the Philippines, probably the same. But for the Burmese people, like the ones who live on the street, because <laughs> most of the activities uh, trying to be happening in the outdoor traditionally. Children playing because of the streets are also the part of the living. So would this 15 minute that urbanism would help that uh, tr uh, traditional way of people living partially on the street? Yes, definitely. Uh, actually, before air conditioning, as was, that was what was mentioned yesterday, before air conditioning, uh, a lot of Metro Manila's, Manila's people were out on the street. We also had arcades. The Americans introduced uh, arcade-type structures that are not, I mean, similar to the five-foot that you'd see in shop houses. Uh, the, unfortunately, new building codes eliminated all of that. Uh, and the internalization of of spaces within within malls within large buildings that that took away life from the city streets. I think one uh, one thing that space in tax helps uh, bring back is that it reminds people that streets are places that it's not just a, a street it's not just a link between place uh, between places but streets themselves are places and that streets are venues for activity and they're the theater of city life so so yes definitely can i can i probably uh question about the, the because i'm dealing with the 10 minute cities too so <laughs> but then my city is a lot of high and down up and down yeah mm -hmm. so would the 10 minute and 15 minute circumference still works when the city in the contours area and how much climate plays some role in that that's that's a very uh you're now you're now asking questions on the cutting edge of space syntax uh, one of the latest phd papers was about uh, phd dissertations was about space syntax and terrain right. uh, and how how distance and ranges reduce they, they uh, reduce or recede depending on how steep the gradient is yeah. and how hot the temperature, the climate is. So, right. so I guess when you say a 10 minute city, it depends. No? If you're 10 minutes in a temperate climate, maybe you could be walking 800 meters up to one kilometer yeah. away. But if you're walking in the Philippines with a hot, yes. hot weather and a lousy sidewalk, maybe 400 meters is a stretch already. <laughs> so, so there's there's a lot of uh, psychography that you have we have to adapt a lot of these learnings from abroad from from the west and from temperate regions and bring them here but i think it's the same it's the same logic if you want to make things accessible you have to bring them things closer and you have to up zone things to be more uh, to have a catchment population uh, i won't be surprised if we run space in tax on Georgetown, and a lot of the shop houses are actually on very integrated and accessible streets. That's why they're very pedestrian. So, so it all goes together. Does, does, does density play some role also in the success of the 10 minutes? Yes. Uh, so, but then it's not too dense, right? Like if it's a so dense like Hong Kong or, or New York, will it still too much. work? Yes, yes. It's a, it's a tricky balancing act because at the end of the day, you want your ground floor permeable frontages, your retail, street, street retail to survive. Yeah. So the objective is to load up on the density such that all these ground floor shops along these streets are, uh, will survive because they have own, their own it's captive market. Yes, 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 yes. So thank you for the question. <laughs> so uh, yeah, is it our conversation is <laughs> not really to go down. Oh, okay. So is there any question for um, Dr. Um, Kishnani? about the vernacular architect and interpretation of it into the modern urban? No? Yes? No? Oh, we have two gentlemen down there. I'm curious, I was thinking about the, you mentioned the craftsman, and I'm wondering if that's scalable, because I can see the projects are very unique and it's a very unique Do you have 
Um, <clears throat> no, thank you for that. I, I think there is a uh, inherent contradiction in, in, in becoming reliant on craft because then solutions feel very bespoke, very customized. And then how do you then replicate this? Uh, Huang Tak Hao doesn't talk about this per se. Um, his projects tend to be these very discreet, very localized interventions. There is another architect though um, in India, Ashok Lal. Um, he is of an era, he's older than Tak Hao, he's, uh, he's one of the regionalist uh, actors of the 70s, 80s, 90s. He has become very interested in how to create industrial um, uh, capacity in craft. I know that sounds like a contradiction, uh, but he, he is genuinely interested in how do we take um, craft and systematize it. Um, the goal being that you then you can then export it to other projects in other parts of India, but that also creates employment uh, for other parts, uh, other craftsmen. So that, and this industrial systematization of craft uh, is something that he talks about a lot in his book and his works. Yeah. Um, and it has to do with uh, um, developing processes by which uh, uh, the craft becomes um, uh, replicable, easily replicable. Thank you for the question. So we have another one question, right? Please. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kisnari. I learned a lot from your presentation and I'm from, from Vietnam as well. Um, my question is, uh, in your work uh, with the Hoàng Thuc Hào architect, I, do you have any uh, consultant with local people and how do they uh, respond to the structure, to the architect, vernacular architecture? Because I think that these uh, buildings were built in the mountainous area and, uh, and Hoàng Thuc Hào used a lot of local knowledge to, to draw and to uh, draw the co construction and of the house. Yeah, thank you, thank, thank you for that. No, I, I, maybe it didn't come across, uh, maybe I went too quickly, but um, uh, a lot of what he does is create community participation. So he begins a project usually with local stakeholders, local craftsmen, um, and the project emerges from that. So there is the idea of local craft and the architect's vision kind of intersecting. Um, so um, in answer to your question, yes. Uh, it is central to what he does. He doesn't import skills or materials. Everything is on site uh, within the community. Uh, and the brief, the formulation of the ideas uh, is done. Uh, it's not preconceived. It's very of It often emerges from these discussions and town meetings, village meetings with people. Yeah. So he's very much about participatory design. Thank you for the question. Then um, I think we can have only time for the last question that has been asked online and then okay. we need to go to break or else someone will come and take microphone from me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. The question is whether, uh, how much we can learn from the other countries in ASEAN that's already undertaken uh, similar initiatives. Uh, I'm afraid I have a, a Burma uh, example, uh, Napidao, and also uh, Putrajaya, yeah? Yes, of course, that uh, building a totally a new city and do that somewhere else yeah. is quite a challenge. And it was also made kind of by force. And it also happened because uh, unless the, you, you are forced, people to move to stay. Correct. But it happened because of this uh, administrative yeah. city and um, uh, designated as a capital, so it happened. But what I see, um, not myself, but my friends, planners, what they have ch um, having challenges because uh, designing the city, lay laying out the plots while the actual field works is already have started. So when the, the map of all the survey map receive in uh, office in Yangon and when they are trying to lay out and next day when they go to the site, there's a some of the hills already bulldozed. Yeah. So it's, it's always <laughs> the plan and the implementation right. are, it's because as you say, it's a time constraint right. and uh, it's so rushed, yes. I, I think adding to that, uh, it's very true that what the plan and what the implementation is two separate things. 
top-down approach is always has this time of tendency and force sort of like relocation also has this kind of consequence but we learned from that we knew about it we know Napidao has certain issues we know Putrajaya takes a long time for people to relocate the design is well done executed uh, it was 20 years ago uh, now we have different technology now we have uh, you know the pandemic give us certain uh, wisdom um, but what I'm trying to kind of uh, differentiate is implementation and planning is one thing the design and the idea and the ideals is there we have KPIs the KPIs will keep us on that level as long as this is the difficult part communicating technical aspect to a political leader is amazingly hard and to make sure our minister our president let the professional uh, to work and believe in them because in all this Putrajaya and Naipidao there is always a hints of the flavor of the taste of the political leaders to be there during Sukarno time Jakarta is heavily influenced by Sukarno and thanks God he's an architect yeah and the next one is an army guy and the third guy is I think I don't know what she is um, our, we have a, a religious leader Abdul Rahman Wahid so the personality of the leader does take shape and this is something that is difficult because as much as our president mentioned about the, the ideals but the translation of this KPI is technical how can you do a 70 percent green 30 percent uh, uh, development area but has to be 10 minutes you will be surrounded with the sea of green unless you put everybody in one location like in Europe but then it, it's not gonna happen because we the, the mentality of our government is why we want to move from Jakarta to Kalimantan because we don't have land in Jakarta we have land in uh, sub Borneo so let's just basically ransack every uh, area in, in the Kalimantan because we have land but they forgot it's only 30 percent of the land so the choices of creating a city that is with this so high KPI come back to that comfortable level uh, Prof Nirmal say it's not gonna be comfortable if you want to walk 10 minute walks if you want to have 80 percent public transport you will have to leave your luxury of your car you have to walk uphill and downhill you will be in sweat you don't like the space because you'll be crammed into a limited 30 percent but then it has to be public transport oriented there's no car park for you there's no I mean alternative energy 100 percent zero carbon city it means everything will be coming from the Sun you're gonna have to drink your own pee your own waste it's not gonna be easy so communicating this ideals is hard and it needs to be coming from the top level because the direction will be all over the place that will ha that's probably what happened in two different examples where the political leader doesn't understand what it takes to get there but then intervention coming in and things start to fall apart after you know they believe that oh Jakarta is a mess so we have to do a better job in Borneo so I'm gonna have twice the size of my uh, mini I mean minister office because it's too small in Jakarta at the same time in the in the five minute city we have to bring everything closer right so these things doesn't gel very well in the in the higher uh, level of the ranks so the failure sometimes coming in the miscommunication too not necessarily time and quality and 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 uh, it's, it's misunderstanding of the concept wow. so I'm, I'm sort of like complaining here <laughs> so I hope that resonates hope my, somewhere my, my minister doesn't hear this <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> okay thank you every speakers and everyone for the attention for this beautiful panel so we learn a lot from this panel about how um, our culture rules our architecture and urban planning so coming up on the next session we will have uh, the youth panel so please for now go for the break and then we will come back in anyone with the time how many how many minutes do we have to come back yes um, ladies and ten, gentlemen ten minutes Yes, we will take a 10-minute break and please 
kindly be back here and take your seats by 325. Thank you very much.